Okay. I want to make sure everybody gets the high. I'm going to uh, I'm going to post. This is this is a much simpler presentation than uh, than I had in the past. So I'm going to post that one in there. If you want to jump into it and you see something you like and you want to you want to poke around in there while I'm talking, feel free. Don't necessarily feel free to uh, to just listen to me here, but. Essentially, I tried to break down kind of some of the topics and building off of yesterday's. Yesterday's we we talked about the uh, the remote learning and uh, or sorry, flipped learning and the flipped classroom type of model and and how could we engage that? How could we how could we make that work? And what are some, what's some of the research around that? So so I tried to I tried to build off of that with a couple of uh, of tools that potentially. Uh, lead into this. I think it all comes out of how you as the classroom teacher put it into play. I don't think that there's there's anything here that is, again, for lack of a better term, a magic bullet that is all of a sudden going to just be like, this is the exact perfect thing and I just have to show up and sign up and life is good. I think it, it all puts it into how you plan the learning activities and the teaching activities uh, to make use of these to get into there. So, so I kind of broke it down into a couple of different pieces here. Uh, the first one being discussion boards. How can we facilitate discussion amongst the students uh, when some of them are here, some of them are away, and we never know who's going to be connected all at the same time? So a few ideas there. Uh, talked about um, access to resources. I know that we have that, and this is sort of the bane of my existence in some ways, that, that digital uh, textbook library. Um, unfortunately, we cannot share that out globally we it's against the copyright and everything uh, but there are opportunities for a couple solutions in there so I it came to my attention that some people didn't know some of the the district passwords and logins for some of those so so I've provided those as well uh, this isn't usually an issue because we're connecting from within the Palliser network and we have all of these IP filtered so when that IP pops up on their end it automatically logs you in now that we're learning from home, that changes. Uh, so we'll look at those and kind of let you know how much you can share them. I wouldn't have shared them with you if you couldn't have shared them beyond that. So so that's uh, if that's any type of learning thing. Then we went into sort of the, the mapping type idea, uh, the learning maps and the choice boards uh, that you can use. I think there's some interesting um, stuff there. And then um, down at the bottom, I know that this is one that's been used and comes up again and again. And essentially, it's because of Flash that some people are looking for other alternatives. But I want you to be aware that when we're looking in this Chrome ecosystem in this online, everybody is moving towards HTML5 or should be moving in that direction. All of the major browsers have said that they are no longer supporting Flash as of 2020. Now, depending on where that comes in 2020, it might be now, it might be later. Uh, some things have turned it off by default, so you have to enable it. And we've, we've shown you how to do that, and I'll show you again. Um, others have just said, no, we're just gonna cut it right off. So, so just so you're aware, these guys still have some of the HTML5s. They've jumped into it and, uh, and looked at some of the HTML5. So I have some suggestions there. So, so just really quickly, I wanna highlight uh, a couple of things. We'll, uh, we'll jump in. I'm gonna present my screen again. Just to confirm here, are you guys seeing my uh, slide presentation? Gord, can you just give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down? You are? Okay, brilliant, thank you. Uh, and just you, because I see your face on there. So it just, it gave me a different message when I when I clicked on here. So um, Flipgrid, if you haven't used Flipgrid, Flipgrid was purchased by Microsoft uh, a couple years back. It is free for all teachers. It is, I, I think it's an absolutely brilliant um, platform. It is one that I definitely suggest using. You can use a uh, login with Google when we get into here. So it's not something um, that is restrictive where the students need to create another account. We do trust these platforms. We do think that they're doing good things. So um, I'm, I'm not hesitant to, to suggest you use this in here. The reason I bring up this one, if it'll load up here, is because uh, Flipgrid has screencasting built right into it or screen recording built right into it. 
So as we look at a platform for our students, I know that I've been pushing, well, I have definitely been pushing WeVideo this year. I think that WeVideo is the platform that a lot of teachers should be using for screencasting and whatnot, or screen recording, excuse me, screen recording and whatnot. But I think that this guy here uh, is something that we can provide access to our students for. And it, it facilitates that discussion because when we get into some of our, our grids, we post topics and our students respond to those topics and then have the ability to respond back and forth to each other if we so choose that, right? Using a video platform. So at the very least, they would be using audio, but they're using a video platform as well. But what I wanted to show you on this one is um, we're gonna record a response to this and, and this would be what our students would see as well. So I set it for a five minute recording or something like that. But what I'm thinking is for uh, not necessarily a presentation, I wouldn't use this for a presentation, but, but something where you want to see them or you want to interact with their screen or the production, the content that they have created, uh, down here in the three dots, there's the option for screen recording. There is also the option for video clips from elsewhere. So they can also grab video from their phone or something like that, mom and dad's phone, anything like that. As long as they can get it to the computer, they can upload that. But we can also do a screen recording. And it's it's essentially just going to record our screen. And I'm not going to go through this. I don't want to uh, bog down the computer. But it's essentially just going to record the screen with the small uh, picture of us down in the bottom corner there as well. And uh, I can't remember if I did for this one or if I did for a different one. And it gives the kids the ability to present their content on their screen and then have the other students in the class respond to that. It can be moderated as well. So I think that this is a tool that has a ton of functionality and could be put into play. Um, I make a note of Google Classroom and using the questions in there. I don't, I'm gonna make the argument that that I don't think that we, in my experience, I didn't see a lot of teachers using uh, the questions inside of classroom because they didn't necessarily, they were inside the class, they didn't necessarily see that. But now that we're gonna have some kids in and some kids not in, using the question, so again, inside of classwork, creating that question might give you the opportunity to sort of start to facilitate those discussion boards inside of there. Typing the question up here, obviously, typing more information down here if you have additional instructions. And then what kind of way do you want the students to answer? You can start out with a multiple choice, but still allow the students to respond to each other's uh, response. You can also just jump straight into a straight answer. So they have to give some type of answer to their question. Down below, I'm going to suggest that we throw a due date in on these guys. And as I was thinking about this, I thought, no due date would facilitate sort of that longer means and it wouldn't necessarily make it into a assignment type thing. But I think because we're dealing with a, a situation, some of our kids right now are not recognizing the due dates and, and they're not being punished for it in any way, shape or form. But by having that due date, we're sort of cramming that conversation into a smaller piece now. We're asking the kids to respond. I can see both sides of having one or not having one, but I think it's... Uh, I think there's some potential there if you put a due date in. Students can reply to each other, this one right here, and then students can edit their own answer, that one right there. Again, just two simple options to get those questions out there, get the kids starting to respond to each other. They're already used to Google Classroom, I am suspecting. And so because of that, I think that this one is a simple tool that's built right in. It's a low barrier to entry to start getting the kids to respond inside of here. And I know that some of the people in here, and I'm, I'm not going to name anybody, but I know that some of the people in here are using that uh, in their classrooms already. So I also threw in Google Chat. Google Chat is like the new Google Hangout. This is um, the Hangout. This is where they're going. This is the new platform that they're going to. It, you should see shortly it being integrated and taking over what your Hangouts within Gmail it's gonna take over that and eventually you're gonna have this as your only chat platform. But what you can actually do is you can create rooms inside of here. And I created a room called Test Room. I added anybody who was uh, inside of this webinar, who, who responded, or sorry, who uh, registered for this webinar into here. So you can jump into this chat. If you go to chat.google.com and jump down into the rooms, 
you should be able to search for a room in here or you can even jump into here and go into browse room. Sorry, that's how we find it, browse rooms. You can, uh, you can jump into this room or if you want. The interesting thing, this is just a chat room. So you can start to set different threads based on the conversations that you want your students talking about or the outcomes that you're addressing within class or something like that. So we can create a thread on, you know, asynchronous tools. By default, because I created that thread, I am following that thread, I will get notifications if posts are posted within that thread, right? Uh, likewise, I can turn on notifications for this entire chat room. I can start it to bring it up into my higher ones if I have a whole bunch of chat rooms. But you could have multiple threads going on with different groups and stuff like that. Yeah, right on, there's Rosina chiming in. So, and And different content can be posted in here uh, it's a little bit more HTML5 friendly and, and more, you know, current with what's happening. Uh, uploading files, files from Drive, meet right inside of here, and then also obviously our emoji stickers, which are oh so important, right? So, so just a different way of doing this. One of the other kind of interesting things, and again, I know some people that are in this meeting are using it inside of their schools are bots. You can add different types of bots in here. Some of them are very useful. Some of them not so much full. Um, so some of them are very business focused, but other ones, there's one in here for running a poll. So you can actually run a poll inside of, of here. There's a Zoom one, a mean meet one. This is for scheduling meetings. You can just ask the bot to schedule meetings. But if we add one of these bots into here, We'll throw it in just really quickly and then we're gonna move on because this isn't just all about chat. It will tell us the commands that we need to enter a different thing. So we can, you know, we can submit different commands to this bot. It's just listening in the background and we'll bring the different things up. So if we wanted GIFs put into here, that's how we would put that guy into here. So not a big deal. I'm gonna move on from this guy, but I think that this might be another interesting one for, um, Keeping those asynchronous, those some kids are here, some kids are connected, other kids are not, other kids are at home, or maybe not even connected to the class at that time. They're busy, their their brother or sister are, are working on the, the platforms that they have and they don't have access. So keeping them all connected at the same time. One of the nice, nice things about uh, all three of these, a lot of stuff I read, and I posted a couple things specifically on Flipgrid for getting started. This is information from Flipgrid. And this one's from Edutopia is just nine ways to use it. You're going to find lists if you search on all of these. Uh, one of the interesting ones I found with Flipgrid, and I think it could be applied on all of these, is the ability to post homework. So a kid who is in class, a student, excuse me, might jump onto Flipgrid or into Google Chat and post a quick video on what's due for homework or some of the key points that they found out of class, something like that, to keep the kids engaged with what's going on. So. Access to resources, want to make sure that you guys have this. One that I think sometimes we overlook is our online reference center. This username, LA44 and password 8966, will get you in. It will get you in from home and it will get your students in from home. You can share this with your students as well, okay? It will not get them into some of the content material. So for example, I mentioned those digital textbooks. All those digital textbooks were downloaded from here. In order to get into that area, you have to have your uh, your teaching certificate number. You have to sign up for an account, verify that it's you and all of that information. Uh, and then you can get into that area. This one will just kind of get you through the front door. It says that you go to, a, uh, to an Alberta school. So the interesting thing is all of these ones in the online reference center are paid sites. So every single one of these sites is a paid site that is uh, taken care of through the Online Reference Center. And if you come through their portal, you don't have to pay for it. So if we just went to, and I'm gonna come down to Pebble Go. If you go directly to Pebble Go, you will have to pay for that service. If you come in through here, it is absolutely 100% free. You will notice on some of these that some of these are just available now. 
um, because it is, and I want to see, there was a, a reference somewhere in here, because of COVID-19, and, and the National Film Board is one that was, I believe, just added because of COVID-19, uh, or potentially it was another one on here. But um, it, so it, it potentially may go away, but a lot of these are science flicks, uh, are Pebble, Pebble Go series, are all available all the time. So you do have to jump in there. You do have to find the resources you want. You do have to make reference to them. But for the ability for the student to get into there and start making use of it, I think it's an absolutely brilliant um, way to get some free access. Um, this one here, for example, the InfoBase databases, temporary access is labeled right there. So the National Film Board wasn't, but labeled right there during times of uh, COVID-19. Um, and actually, I, I just noticed this one. I thought this was kind of cool when I was looking the other day. Um, one from Gord Downey, uh, which is, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but Tragically Hip Fan and, and whatnot. I, I think that was pretty cool. So, uh, and I think that that would be an interesting one to take a look at. It is aged. That doesn't mean that that is the only age group it can be used for, but it is aged inside of there to help you out. So, so definitely some interesting uh, tools inside of there. We generally go to the T4T courses, I would argue, or the program of studies. Uh, these ones here are going to be secured. So you would have to go through that additional login to get to those guys right there. You can search and get content on a lot of it, but otherwise, um, you're only able to access student resources. You have to sign into a teacher account to get the real thing. So the, the deeper one, right? Um, Learn360, I mentioned this yesterday as our video one, and we are also doing that survey. I mentioned that as yesterday as well, the video survey on using this resource. Um, I want to make note of, and I close that window, so I'm gonna go back to InfoBase Learn360, login. When you go to Learn360, it jumps up on this page right here. The login that you can share out is Palliser RD and then digital for your password. And you can share that, oops, you can share that with your students as well to get them into here. And again, um, the content from in here, you can share into your Google Classroom. So you can connect it to your Google Classroom and allow you to post those links directly in there so the students can access it. We wanna make sure they can. So, so one of the things there is to remember that I would also suggest that once you get in here as a teacher, you jump into your My Profile and sign in with your Google account. This is gonna allow you to have your own little personal place inside of Learn360 to sort of store those, you know, here are the videos that I like, here's what I wanna, you know, here's what I maybe wanna use later on and stuff like that. I don't know that kids necessarily need to, but um, you would definitely want to do that. And some of the content is adjusted for provincial curriculum. Is it with the Learn360 or is that with the uh, with the oh, online resource center? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a little oh, bit more over yeah. focus. That's right, Kyla. Yeah, yeah. So um, again, inside of here, tons of different things, principles for inside of class, but then there's also the videos, the activities. There is some lesson plans and whatnot on here. This one I was looking at the other day, the maps and flags, it was kind of interesting. I, I, I thought it was kind of neat and stuff like that, but definitely something that uh, to keep you active, keep you uh, keep your kids engaged with the content without them having to worry about an additional level of firewall or passwords or logins or anything like that. So, so something to to be aware of there. And again, both those passwords you can share with your students. So. Learning maps and choice boards. I mentioned this one yesterday, the idea of learning maps. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about choice boards, but I wanted to show you a couple of the different tools that I found that I think can be helpful for this. Number one was some templates. I know that Google Slides are not the most fabulous in some ways, shapes and forms, but there's a ton of templates going on out there. Uh, I was jumping into, we'll just jump into education here that are pretty good. Um, let's do this e-learning presentation one. One of the nice things about this is they are free. Okay, so on the, on this site, if you search other ones, they'll be free as well. You have different themes, so you can change your color palette inside of there. Excuse me, but inside of your template, excuse me, it's essentially set up for you. All of the, you know, 
all of the pieces are in there and you can move them and shake them and, and duplicate them and put them where you want. So you don't have to start with the really bland ones that are in there, the really simple ones, which is generally what I end up starting with, right? So some really good ideas you can link, uh, again, with Google Slides, you can link inside of your templates to different slides. So you could jump to different pieces. As we, I'm gonna slide through pretty quickly here. I'm gonna jump to the back end of these and just show you a couple things with regards to this. Uh, they have some a lot of different ones. Again, copy them, slide them around, and stuff like that. And finally, here we go. They do ask that you leave the uh, thanks slide inside of here. So is it this thanks slide, or I want to say, yeah, I think it is that one because it does reference the people who did it, just giving a little bit of copyright uh, love inside of there. It gives you the credits, so you can uh, you can leave those in there to reference where you got all this stuff. And then it does give you a little bit of additional um, pieces that you can make use of. So if there was a image or an icon inside of there that you really liked, maybe you wanna jump down and bring that into another one, it gives you those inside of here that you can grab and you can use in other places so so again kind of a double duty when you start to grab these and make use of them and then you keep your iconography uh very consistent throughout all your presentations or something like that but i like the idea of doing that another one that i i found just the other day was this guy chemix i don't know if anybody's aware of this one but when i'm thinking with regards to our science uh, and we're gonna get into uh, simulations and uh, interactive simulations next. I think that sometimes we are not able to present what we want in a, really, in a way that we like, and so we spend a ton of time searching for diagrams that show us what we want, when in some cases we could be creating them. So this guy just allows you to start creating a science experiment essentially as you go. Um, and putting in all the pieces to show the setup and stuff like that. So again, thinking about the synchronous asynchronous, if we're talking about setup for a lab, when our kids are in the school, we want them doing the lab, we want them being active and engaged in the learning and not necessarily going through the setup of equipment and everything like that. Again, uh, I know that, that you guys do a wonderful job with that, but I mean, just thinking of a way where that could be set up in advance so the students know what they're doing or maybe even being able to print this off and have a copy at their, at their lab station or something like that when they're looking at, at some of the content. It is quite simple to use. There is additional bits for biology, so we can bring in a microscope if you want and whatnot. Um, there's, it is really science focused with regards to this. So we wanna make sure that the kids are wearing their goggles and everything, hey? But it is kind of cool and kind of simple with regards to that. I'm also thinking that when our students are doing their write-ups around some science project, this is something they could bring in. There potentially could be used with some of our younger students as well. There is some stuff with, you know, some simple scissors, ice cubes, whatnot, labels inside of here and everything like that. So, so there's some very simple stuff just to make that content available to them afterward or before they get into there. I also use icons. I've been using these guys a lot lately. This is flat icons. So I did show you the ones at the end of that template. Most of those come from these guys here, flat icon. These are for the most part free, as long as you provide uh, attribution um, to their, their services there. So I talked about the idea of using a, um, Google slide for a learning map. Yesterday we talked about learning maps, almost like mind maps. And there's actually a link in this one here to this Creality. It's a, it's a mapping software. I don't know that you know we're going to buy that and I don't know that that's the one you need to, to use. But as we look at mind maps inside of here, if we start to use our connecting elbows and we'll, we'll keep it kind of simple. You see how those little purple dots pop up and we can sort of direct the flow of our students learning by doing some things like that. This is also true if we bring in images or icons or anything like that, we can sort of, we can create a flow and a flow chart for our students learning and that learning map type idea. And they do have some good things on this Creality. I will make note of that partway down, they have their templates, but then partway down they have their best practices and how to make a learning map type idea 
And I think it's definitely worth it to, to take some time and just read through that. To me, that's not a, a long read and it gives you some steps in order on how to do it and, and how to create those. So I think a lot of it from what I was reading could be done within Google Slides. The other one is these choice boards. TCEA, which is the Tex Texas Computer Educators Association, has a great post on uh, choice boards. And essentially, think of a tic-tac-toe board and we want our students to get a win. We want them to get one line. So we create one of these boards with activities in the different sections that are going to guide them down that learning path that we want them to. So we, it's, it's probably gonna be a little bit more work than a learning map, but it gives the students a little bit of choice in the direction that they're going and gives them some additional activities and some ways of showing based on their learning style and everything like that. So, so I think that there's some potential with regards to that. I think also what you could do with that is you could label some of the activities at school and some of the activities at home to help the students sort of differentiate, you know, what you think they can do at home without you and what they, you know, potentially need additional help at school, sort of an instructional block or something like that. So uh, something to consider uh, with regards to, to that one there. So. Uh, and I know some people use Padlet and Wakelet for that. There's also another one called Lino IT, L-I-N-O dot I-T, I think. If you search Lino, L-I-N-O-I-T, you will find that. That's another one that I've seen, right? Obviously, because these are all cloud-based services, we can embed hyperlinks to dig deeper and, and get farther down with regards to that. So, And then last, coming back to this, is our FET simulations. I do want to... oh. Did I not link it in there? Oh, I did. Oh, there we go. Oh, perfect. I thought I deleted the link. So um, the FET simulations are, are, you know, they're the ones I think we have a lot of people who are using them from the University of Colorado and Boulder. We've had a lot of people using them before. The HTML5 ones will run on Chromebooks without having to do anything else. So just so you're aware, those ones are all in there. Um, there is an app. You don't have to buy the app. These are all available to be used. There are stuff on math and science, primarily a lot of good ones in here. But I do want to show you really quickly one that is not HTML5. We'll just grab, oops, that one is. We'll see if we can grab, uh, we'll grab this density one here because I want to make sure that you guys are aware on how to make use of it. Um, if we click play, it's going to give us an error that no flash is available. In order to, to get around this, you want to jump up to the, the uh, lock just to the left of the address. Scroll down. Sometimes flash turns up here. Sometimes it doesn't. But if you go to the site settings, and you need to do this individually to your sites, you will be able to see underneath permissions, flash. And we just wanna change it from block to allow. You can then close this settings page. It's going to ask you to reload this page and then we'll get right into the content of what we were doing before. So, so this is true with any flash site. If you ever are working on a Chrome OS or your students are working on a Chrome OS, cause I know we still have some resources there. Um, this is true on any of those. They can always jump into it for at least the next about six ish months, right? Um, it's kind of, I've heard different reports coming out of, of different places on what's going to happen in the fall, but I won't even bother to load this up. Trust me when I say it's coming and it's going to get there. So I don't know if I really touched on everything that you wanted. Hopefully you got some resources here. I, like I said, I really think it's going to come up to how do you put these into play? If you have ones that you want to share with me, I will definitely add them to this. If you have some asynchronous and synchronous tools. Uh, if you have ideas that you want to move forward with, please let me know. Uh, post it in that chat room. I got you guys all in there. You guys can leave if you want. It's not a big deal. But um, but other than that, I th thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, I appreciate you coming. Hopefully, you took at least one idea out of here moving forward. And uh, if you don't like these and you want some more, I, I have additional ones. But enjoy your day. Tomorrow, we're going to look at about worksheets. We're going to stick on this theme and look at how we can digitize worksheets without not just PDFing them, not that that's bad, but uh, 
we'll look at something else. And uh, yeah, so thank you guys. I'll stick around as always if anybody has any questions. So.